We're going to start with the cats because everybody is interested in mountain lions and we do a lot of different presentations on them. Um, mainly on the update, the status, what's going on with them in the state of Missouri. Um, this is going to be more geared toward the Missouri River. So we're probably not going to cover as much as you'd like to know about mountain lions, but we'll have plenty of time for questions. So. Just kind of a background. Um, the dates of disappearance in the Midwest, you can see Missouri there, 1927 was the last recorded mountain lion that we think um, it was shot. And then the other states surrounding, 1908, 1890. And again, this is just the Midwest. The blue portion there is a historic, or the, uh, where the populations are currently today. And you see the little tip of Florida. That's the Florida panther. There's still a population down there. Some of these slides are fairly old because our, we're not doing a whole lot of research now like we did from uh, 1996 to about 2010. Um, from 2006 to 2010, we were stuck on 10 mountain lion occurrences in the state of Missouri. In 2010, <clears throat> everything seemed to explode. We went from 10 confirmed occurrences in 2010 to 55 today, actually 58. Three of them were pretty positive or the same cat. Um, we have uh, like trail cam photos on the same night, you know, two miles apart. So we're gonna assume that's probably the same cat. Um, so we have actually three more, so 58, but if you look on our website, it's officially 55. Confirmed occurrences. Confirmed occurrences mean we have actual proof. We have a photo that we've been out to and confirm it, it was taken on that farm in that location, that tree. Um, we have confirmed scat with DNA. Um, we have confirmed hair follicles with DNA, or we have a carcass that we know for sure is a mountain lion. We have confirmed, I think, two tracks. We don't like to do that. Uh, the reason this last track was confirmed was because of a photo, again, that we confirmed within the vicinity. So we don't like confirming tracks because yes, we can positively say it's a cat track, but we don't know what kind of cat made it. So it's hard to say, yeah, that's, this is a mountain lion confirmation. So again, the confirmations don't mean that the cats are here in Missouri. It's an occurrence. It's been here and, and yes, we're going we're gonna to say that. So some of this information is old, um, like this slide here is showing from 2000, 1900 to 2000, the number of mor uh, mountain lion mortalities from 1900 to 2000, you can see how they increase. So the mountain lion population is in fact growing. Um, some of the states, if you look at this by state, again, this is I think 2000 or 2006, which is gonna be still pretty similar as far as the populations go. Um, if you look at South Dakota, that's number two as far as the smallest population, that's showing probably two or 300, and that was about what they thought in 2000. Um, they're probably up to 500 to 1,000 now with the dispersal rate coming out of the Black Hills. Florida is uh, the, the least amount of population. They're guessing around 100 cats, and they're actually called panthers, but they're still mountain lions. Um, Florida was always a good marking point for mountain lions because roads, road systems are one of your best monitors for wildlife. Um, Florida has at least one roadkill mountain lion a month with a small population of 100 cats, roughly right in that area. So the, a road system is a really good indicator if you have a population or not. We've had three road killed cats since 1996 in the state of Missouri. So um, the two top states, Idaho and California. California is probably increased, I'm not gonna say twofold, but at least time and a half, California has basically no regulated mountain lion hunting or trapping in the state right now. Colorado is the other state that's really regulated. Um, so they're not controlling their populations, thus the cats are moving down into populated areas and causing more problems. 1990 to present, and I think this one took us up to 2006. Um, outside of the established ranges, these were, again, mountain lion confirmations. We don't use class one and class two confirmations. Like I said, we use uh, physical proof. Um, class one and class two confirmations usually indicate either DNA or a photo. 
DNA is, is really solid proof. So, but you can see how they're spread out. This little green indicator right there, that's the Black Hills. Another small population in North Dakota. See that grouping right there? That's Nebraska. They went from uh, zero, no mountain lions, to a population in less than 10 years. And almost all those cats came out of the Black Hills of South Dakota. DNA has gotten so good these days. You know, it used to be when uh, we could look at DNA for, say, a wolf, um, and it would just come back canine. Coyote and wolf, it, it would only tell us canine. We couldn't identify what it was. DNA now tells us, um, for the wolves again, where they come from. We can pinpoint it to Michigan. We can pinpoint it to Wisconsin. We can pinpoint it to Minnesota. The same with these mountain lions. They all have a little bit different strain, like the, the strain out of uh, Nebraska has a South Dakota makeup to it, but it's their own Nebraska DNA now. They've got it that pinpointed. So we can actually tell where these cats come from. And they're all on database out in Wyoming, I believe. So we can look up, we can get DNA from a cat here, from SCAT, and figure out where that cat came from. Um, Florida, that's the other one down here. Texas has got a, a fairly good population. For some reason, we don't see any of these cats coming up our way. And I think we're going to maybe cover a little bit about that. So, Over 100 confirmed incidents of cougars were documented from 1990 to 2006. Most of the states use the same uh, confirmation that we do. Michigan, for a while, was just taking people's words for it, and, and we don't like to do that because uh, I've got a picture on here. Mountain lion dispersal. Um, Mountain lions have a territory. Males have a very large territory. It'll be anywhere from 60 to 160 miles, and they will patrol that territory. Um, so when we get people saying, hey, I've got a mountain lion, it lives behind my house. You know, I see it every, no, that's not true. I can tell you it's not true because that's not their habit. That's what they, they don't do that. That male cat will patrol its territory, and it'll breed with multiple females inside that territory. Female mountain lions have a much smaller territory. Um, say 30 to maybe 80 miles. It varies depending on where they're at. Um, territorialism is pretty high in male mountain lions. They will protect their territory. They'll fight other cats and they'll kill them to get them out of their territory. Thus, male mountain lions are hot-wired for dispersal. They're, especially when we, when we start looking at the Black Hills, it's a small, small area. How many have been to the Black Hills? It's, it's basically, what, 50 miles wide by about 150 miles long, roughly. That's not a lot of space for 500 plus or minus mountain lions. That's a lot of cats in that small area. When we were there, I did a week out there for our mountain lion studies. We didn't have to get out of the pickup to find mountain lion tracks. We could drive down any Forest Service road and just look out the window and find tracks. So we had our hands on a lot of cats. Um, they disperse at roughly 10 to 18 months. Most of the cats that we've... Uh, gotten here. Um, we've had six, six carcasses now, three, three or four um, hit on the road, and we've had four shot. So maybe we have more than that now, carcass-wise. Um, they've all been roughly what we can guesstimate from, from uh, teeth analysis around 18 to 24 months. And there's some visible things, and I'll, I've got a picture of that too, that you can tell you know, where they're at in their stage of life. Um, females disperse at a lower rate. The females uh, in South Dakota, the mother, female, the, the mother cat will allow the young females to, to stay in her territory a lot of times. So the, the female dispersal rate isn't as great. There has been one female that, was, uh, that traveled over 830 miles with a radio collar. Um, but generally, they, they just don't do that since the mother allows the females to stay in her territory as well. So. This was the cat that was killed in Lynn County on a coyote hunt by um, a group of Amish farmers out coyote hunting. It happened to jump up and got shot. But if you look at this cat, um, again, we determined 18 to 24 months. Do you guys know that uh, young mountain lions are spotted just like bobcats? 
I don't like telling people that because when they say, oh yeah, I, I saw a female with three young, what'd they look like? Well, they looked just like her. They were, t you know, tan colored and, well, then I don't know what you saw, but it wasn't a mountain lion because young mountain lions are spotted all the way up until about 18 to 24 months. And you can still see the spots on this guy. Young male, you know, so when you see a picture and we get trail cam pictures, a lot of times we can tell how old they are, what, at least a good guess, by looking at their coloration, because they carry those spots for about two years until they finally fade away. This was, uh, and not a lot of people realize how big these cats really are. This was a 121 pound cat. And that's about average for an 18 to 24 month old cat. And you say that and you look at it, but just, you just really, they're big. You know, they're almost, as big. if you saw the picture on the internet, that was a 124 pound cat. And it was as big as me holding it up. I mean, they're big, they're big animals. They're hard to mistake, but they often, they're, mis they're mistaken a lot for other species, so. This is a, a satellite image. There's the Black Hills, and there's our beloved river system coming down here. And you can kind of see the green space where these cats are, how they move. Radio Mark mountain lions have been moving out of the Black Hills and going almost 700 miles. This is an old slide, 2006, 2010 data. We've got a collared mountain lion out here in Ohio. So not us, not Missouri. <laughs> it came from another state, but it was tracked all the way to Ohio. So they're traveling a lot further now. What are they looking for? Guys, what were you looking for when you were 18 to 24 years old? Beer. Well, <laughs> that's what they're looking for. If they find a female, then they'll set up a territory. And right now, that's all we're missing in our equation in the state of Missouri that we know of right now is a female. How will a female get here? Well, she could um, disperse out. You think Texas would be a closer state? It is actually closer um, mile-wise, but we have not got any DNA from Texas cats. So I'm not sure if the, the river system truly is our corridor that they're using. It seems to be because they're not coming up from the south. They're all coming from the west. But that's all it'll take is a female, and then we'll probably have a population. If they don't, if a female doesn't uh, disperse here, there's always the possibility someone will let one go. And there are cats in the state. We used to have at least 50 captive cats. People had permission and had permits, breeders permits. Once we implemented stricter regulations where they had to have uh, microchips, tattoos, and blood and DNA on file in Jefferson City so they could be held responsible for that cat, um, we lost about half of them. So there's about 25 legal mountain lion breeders in the state. Uh, we don't know how many illegal ones because these cats, mountain lions, uh, leopards, stuff like that are being used by the illegal drug trade as watch animals. Because usually police don't like to bust in on a house and go into the living room if there's a large cat sitting there. <laughs> so they're using them as guard animals. And cats are very in tune. Um, they pick up you know, cars come in a driveway, they can watch their cat and know someone, you know, they're being, in, they're being raided. So they're used a lot. This is current. Um, this is if you go to our website, if you did, this is our current map right now of confirmed confirmations by county. It used to be dots, but they went to counties. And I want you to pay close attention to this right down here. But again, here's our beloved river. You can see how they follow it. And then from there, when we get looking at our river maps, they're following all the rivers to get down into different areas. Right in here has happened within 2011 to present day. And there was just a cat, and you guys probably saw it on the news, there was a cat killed a couple of months ago down in Laclede County or whatever, Reynolds, Reynolds County. So, got hit and then was shot by uh, troopers. And here's another good uh, satellite image again, Missouri River. As it comes down, you've got our lake system down south and then our bigger lake system down south. River goes through, 
I think that's the Grand River drainage, Flat River. And again, the Black Hills would be over here. But they've got all this green space to follow. There's another good one. This is a confluence of the Mississippi River, Missouri River around St. Louis. I and mean, look at the green corridors they have, all wildlife, not just mountain lions, but deer, everything that a mountain lion will feed on, especially deer. That's their number one food source. The mountain lion that was just killed, we found a raccoon in it, a whole raccoon, or parts of a whole raccoon. Uh, another good satellite image. And again, this one I, I picked up because there's our Black Hills. There's our Missouri River coming down. You can almost, I mean, it's not hard for me to visualize how they're moving. Coming to Nebraska, then coming across the Platte. Iowa doesn't have as many confirmations. Um, Illinois doesn't have as many. So for some reason, they are really following the Missouri River corridor and coming down. They're obviously getting across the river. They can, and will they use bridges? Who knows? Um, they'll swim it for sure. Um, somebody asked earlier on wolves. Yes, we've had four wolves now confirmed in the state of Missouri. Um, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota wolves. And you think about how they get down. They have to cross major interstates and get through the Mississippi River in some places. So they're finding ways to do it. This is the cat that showed up in 2010 in uh, Park Villa, Riverside. I had to go out on this one. We got a call. It was late at night, and I got a picture. And normally when I get a picture and somebody says, I got a picture of a mountain lion, well, up until then, up until 2010, I'd never seen a, a picture of a real mountain lion. I'd, been, I'd had mountain lions in my hands and everything, but nothing was ever confirmed. And then I, I opened my phone up and I got this. And, you know, what's the first thing you say is, oh, crap, that's a mountain lion. <laughs> so I sent it to my boss that same night. And my boss says, oh, crap, that's a mountain lion. <laughs> so we were there bright and early in the morning, confirmed the tree, had, had uh, nice claw marks on the tree. It was on the guy's property, like he said. We got hair, but we didn't have any follicles. So we couldn't get any DNA out of it. That was in November of 2010. Not sure if I've got, no, I didn't include the other picture. Uh, the picture of me on the internet holding that cat. Is Steve here? Steve, the guy that wrote that up? He embellished a little bit. That cat was the cat that was shot in Ray County by a coon hunter that made up a big story about it, and he was lying. Um, he unfortunately didn't get a ticket. Nobody has gotten a ticket for shooting a cat yet. Um, and I think we probably set precedent on that one in Ray County. We should have gave that guy a ticket. We should have been in jail for shooting a mountain lion. He said it was attacking cows. He was out coon hunting at night and shot it um, and then tried to cover it up. But that was actually the cat that was killed in Ray County 28 days later after this one. And if we had a, maybe I can show, uh, find one later, but um, direct beeline along the river to where it was killed 28 days later. And that's about right for their dispersal pattern. So unfortunately we couldn't prove it was the same cat. It wasn't this cat, but we, we've got a, we're pretty sure it was. So. This cat, um, I don't know if you guys can see it or not. This was a confirmed uh, trail cam photo out around St. Louis. I'm going to say maybe Lynn County. And we didn't notice this at first, but after really studying it, does anybody see what's on that cat? It's got a radio, it's an antenna, it's got a radio collar on it. That cat came from Utah. So, not all of our cats come from the Black Hills. We've gotten DNA from Colorado, Wyoming. Uh, Idaho, and then this Utah cat. So, um, but the majority of them are coming from the Black Hills of South Dakota. This was really cool. Um, this is a nighttime satellite image of where, where we kind of want to look at. Kansas City, St. Louis. That's not Sturges. It's, <laughs> it's, it's Grand Rapids. It could be Sturges at, on Bike Week, but... That, that is the Black Hills. That, that's, uh, I think, Grand Rapids is right there. Um, and I've got a better one. There's the whole United States. Remember where our mountain lion population is? It's out west. There's nobody there. It's pretty empty, and that's what they want. And those are our largest population. 
Florida, remember we've got about 100 down here. Um, there's our Black Hills again. And there's right here, Kansas City, St. Louis. We look at our Black Hills. Remember those counties I showed you down south? Matches up. Dave Hamilton came up with this when we were really looking at the Missouri River Corridor. Um, he's got some better photos, but I couldn't, couldn't find them. Um, I tried and tried and tried, and I'm sorry, but he's got some really good photos. How it matches up population-wise, which we can tell by lights from space, and he had a road overview. And of course, there's not many roads out here either. No population, no roads. So, and that's what these cats like. They like seclusion. But we actually do have a, have a spot that matches up. And down in those counties, if you're familiar with uh, Missouri, here's another good satellite image. Again, the Black Hills. You see how small it really is in comparison. This is where the Nebraska population is. Very, very small. And again, our, our river systems. And the Badlands, but they're kind of following you know, you can still see creeks and rivers in here. They're following to the green space and then down. There's another good one. I want to say that's the Platte River system and then again up and what would that be? Omaha? Maybe? Something up there. But again, the, you look at that corridor. It's just huge. Huge corridor for everything to follow. And then if you follow our river systems, you know, because we've got, if you look at our map, and I think, yeah, there's our map. Look at where the confirmations are. And then look at our river systems again, following off the Missouri. And again, this spot right here. There's something going on down here. And we don't know what yet. Seven in, in uh, Shannon, six in Reynolds, five in Carter. Jeff Berenger is our new fur bear biologist. He was down last week. We have, anybody know what we've got down here? Yeah. Elk. elk. We reintroduced elk. Here's my joke. Those mountain lions can smell those elk. <laughs> That's why they're showing up down here. They like, ooh, I, I like elk more than deer. It's a bigger steak. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's why we put elk there. Remote areas, um, very few roads, um, and we own a lot of public ground down there. So that's why we put the elk there. It was perfect habitat for them. It also matched up with the hab habitat Dave Hamilton found would, would match for mountain lions. Least amount of roads, least amount of people, and the amount, the amount of food available in deer population. And now there's elk, so it's like a buffet. Um, Jeff Barron, we had an elk, um, our elk are getting brainworm, which is common, and we don't have a big herd, but we're losing them, and we just got another trail cam photo a week, week and a half ago of a mountain lion on an elk. We don't know if it died of brainworm, we don't know if an elk killed it. So our goal is to capture that mountain lion and put a collar on it and see where it goes and see what it's doing. We've had a scat dog, we've, we've got a lady that has, um, I think it's a golden retriever that's trained on mountain lion scat and we'll go out and find it if we call her and then we can have it DNA tested and, and see where those cats are coming from. So we're doing everything we can. We're transparent about it. Everybody says, well, we released mountain lions. We've done it. We've, did the, we've never released a mountain lion to study or anything like that. A guy did catch one a couple years ago, bobcat trapping down around, uh, uh, what is it, Taney Mountain, somewhere down in southeast. Um, we didn't have a collar available. Otherwise, we probably would have collared that cat. We did take blood samples. Um, we got the DNA out of it, and we took it down to Arkansas and let it go. No, I'm kidding. We, we, let it go. <coughs> we let it go in Missouri. We wanted to take it to Arkansas and let it go, but we took it down as far as we could on public land, on our land, and released it. So we're not sure what's going on down here. There very well could be. I mean, that, that's just that's crazy, and it's all in a... In a, in a isolated area, three or four counties. And these cats don't do that. They keep moving. So is this the same cat? Is it, are these cats 
coming through and then eventually finding this spot, which is, is likely, but we're not 100% positive. So if we do catch that cat, we'll, we'll put a collar on it and just see what's going on. Um, if we get a female, that's probably where it's going to turn up. We'll be down there. That's all of them, all of our confirmations. And this is what we got to be careful of. Has anybody seen this before? And you're all going, oh, wow. <laughs> Come on, I can do some fun stuff on, on a computer, and I'm not that literate. I went to a small college, and they didn't give us much over three-syllable words. So <laughs> this, this is Photoshopped. And this is something I do almost, well, in the wintertime, it seems like daily. Uh, in the summertime, when we get more reports in the wintertime because there's no vegetation. So every critter out there is now a mountain lion that they see against the snow background or no vegetation. It's, and people, for some reason, there still is a mountain lion mania. I want to be the first one to confirm one. You know, I've got proof. And people are doing this on the Internet. What they don't realize is we have a huge library system that I can look up almost any mountain lion photo and find it. And this is just Photoshopped in. That's a normal cat picture somebody got off a trail camera. That's why his eyes are lit all, all lit up, because the flash. And they just photoshopped it in. looks real, though, doesn't it? So we're, we deal with this all the time. And that's why when we get a, a picture, we go out and confirm that it was actually taken there. Because people have sent them in from South Dakota, Wyoming, it, everywhere, and say, yeah, this was, uh, this was in my backyard at Smithville. You know, so we're constantly investigating it. Um, and, and we have to. We want to know, and we want to report it. When we confirm a mountain lion, you guys know within 24 hours. It's on the news or it's on our website. So we, we don't hide anything. That was mountain lions, and we'll have a question period if you want to get... There's, there's so much more. I could have done a whole presentation on mountain lions because they are cool and they're interesting. But for what we're doing on the Missouri River system, I think that, that covered it fairly well. So... This is another big one. Mountain lions don't have that big an impact on us. I mean, they're just another mammal. Um, they're, they're a carnivore, a large carnivore. But as far as um, they're not going to have an impact on anything in Missouri, really. It, they're not going to hurt anything. These guys are going to have an impact on everything in Missouri and everything else in, in the United States. This is the big head or silver carp, invasive species. And they're a filter feeder. They eat plankton and algae. Those two things determine um, how an aquatic system will develop and what can sustain in there. Um, they are voracious, voracious feeders. Voracious. See, that's just three syllables, and I still had trouble with it. Um, every, everything in the water is a constant buffet table to them. They just, they're like our paddlefish. Our paddlefish is a plankton eater. It's a filter feeder. It just swims with its mouth open, and that's all it eats. That's what these guys do. It was thought that they were brought into um, the southern states in the early 70s, and they were, but the flooding is what they thought got them into our river system, into the Mississippi, now into the Missouri, and pretty much all the way to the Great Lakes. Um, but they've come to figure out that some of these actually had established somehow, had gotten into our river systems, but it's all blamed on. They brought them in to filter their sewage lagoons, um, and clean up their ponds down south, and then with the, all the flooding, they got into every waterway. So now they're, they're spread. H have you guys been on the river and seen this? In the 1970s, Silver carp were accidentally introduced into these waters after escaping from a fish farm. They now outnumber local fish by 10 to 1. They have some truly bizarre behaviour. Some can clear three meters in a single leap. The secret of this extraordinary behavior lies in the boat's motors. 
The fish mistake pressure waves from the propeller for the movement of predators and literally jump with fright. They react in alarm to every passing boat. With numbers close to bursting point, each leaping fish scares its neighbor, creating a dangerous chain reaction. As some weigh over 40 pounds, collisions can be deadly. In some parts of the river, 200 fish missiles can launch at any one time. They have already caused serious injuries, and as they spread to other rivers, the danger increases by the day. But if you've been on the river and saw this, it's incredible um, what they do, and, and as large as they get. That's a pretty good photo with a variety of sizes. Um, they've got them up to 110 pounds. Um, people have been injured, boats broken. Um, 2010, one of the canoers in the, the river race that goes all the way to St. Louis was actually injured and had to drop out of the race at Lexington. Got hit by a big head cart. This is um, kind of how they're spreading. And again, it's the, the Mississippi River and then, of course, the Missouri River, all the way up to the Great Lakes. And the Great Lakes are really in danger um, because they are such a specific, uh, how do I want to say it? Everything in there depends on plankton and algae growth. And if that's eliminated, the Great Lakes will die again, kind of like Lake Erie used to be. Um, all the species in there depend on that. They depend on threadfin shad uh, and different shad species that that's what they eat on and that's what other fish in turn eats on, the invertebrates, everything like that. It's all one big cycle. And these carp will ruin that cycle. They've got um, barriers put up and the main point I think, is right there at Chicago, because that's the entry point to Lake Michigan, which we'll get in every other Great Lake. Um, they spent <clears throat> 13 million dollars trying to stop them, and it basically didn't. They've got them stopped, but it's not a solution. Um, they're still working on it. The Great Lakes provide seven or eight billion dollars of recreational industry every year. To stop it, it's going to cost about 17 billion dollars to stop these carp from getting in there. They're doing a really good job. But as you can see how they're going, um, what do you guys know about our river system? If you look at what's right here on the Missouri Dam. Dam. Um, Iowa, what's right there? Another dam, lock dams. That will stop them. We're pretty lucky because they're in the Missouri River which means they're in the Big Blue River, which means they're in the Little Blue River, which means they're in Shoal Creek, which means they're in the Fishing River. They're everywhere here in Kansas City, but every river that comes up to one of our lakes has a dam that they cannot breach and get into. I've caught thousands below Blue Springs Dam out of the Little Blue River. When it floods, they can get over the roller dams that are between here and the river. So they're stacked up below Blue Springs Lake. They're stacked up below Longview Lake. Yes? What's different about the dam I'm, I'm not sure if, it, if the flood has something to do, do with that, um, and I'm not sure if that's Davenport, roughly, because Lock Dam number 10 is up here in Guttenberg. Um, so yeah, something right there has stopped them, stopped what they consider a danger. They have found DNA from Asian carp up further. They've actually found DNA on Lake Michigan, but... Um, not Asian carp yet, so I'm not sure if there's something different in that lock dam system or if flooding has le allowed them to progress up further, but yeah, something is stopping them. So what scares me is we do have dams. I mean, they're going into the Osage, the Osage River Basin. That hits all of our major lakes down south. Uh, Palm, Truman, Lake of the Ozarks, um, but we all have, we have dam systems on those, which they can't breach. But the White River is our other big lakes, which are our clear lakes. Uh, Table Rock, Bull Shoals, Tanicomo, Beaver. 
and that's the White River Basin. So if, if we have tremendous flooding where somehow, you know, they get into all these little feeder creeks that go into these rivers. If something floods and then goes into the White River system that drains to the south, they, they could get in our lakes that way. And those are our clear water lakes, again, very, I'm not going to say similar to the Great Lakes, but very more diverse than Lake the Ozarks, Truman, you know, so it is, it's a scary thing. Um, they haven't found really any way to stop them. This is a barrier up around uh, Chicago, and it's electrified, um, and they've got them placed different places, and they don't find carp within four or five miles of it, but they're finding DNA. So it is, it is slowing them down. They tried um, rotenone, rot rotone, it's a, it's a chemical that suffocate fish. And they actually tried it up there. Um, it, it did kill everything, but it kills everything, not just big head and silver carp, but it didn't stop them. So. Commercial fishermen are a great idea, but there's really no place for these fish yet. Um, some of them do go to zoos. Um, a lot of them are being used for fertilizer. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole new market out there, a new industry that, that's probably going to develop, but it just hasn't been tapped yet. They are very good to eat. Um, it's a delicate white meat. They're, they're a filter feeder, so it's actually a very, very good meat. They're just slimy, messy, and the minute they hit your boat, they, they jump in your boat. Um, they bleed all over the place, so people don't like messing with them because they are kind of nasty, and they're ugly, ugly, and they stink. <laughs> oh. But uh, commercial fishermen could really help out. When we go uh, fishing on the river, we just stick a net out the side, and that's how we get our bait. Oh. Very, very bad. And again, it's the Missouri River system and everything off of it. Um, again, here's our river. They can access basically the whole state, in my opinion. They'll have a little more trouble down here because this is a different drainage basin, but all of this goes to the Missouri River, everything. And they will eventually be in, every, if they're not right now, which they probably are, they will be in every creek and water system we have. You have the Big Blue River, Little Blue River, up north you've got the Fishing River, uh, Shoal Creek, um, a lot of private lakes, but our three lakes here in the, in the metropolitan area, um, right now they are protected by dam systems. We do have regulations with the department that you cannot transport live big head or silver carp. You can use them for bait, but they have to be dead. Um, but you cannot transport them at all. Same with zebra mussels. Um, we recommend you scrub your boats, motors, everything before you go from one body of water to the next because zebra mussels are the same thing. They're another filter feeder, and they are destroying some of the lake systems. They're in the Great Lakes right now. So we've got them in most of our lakes right now. So the Missouri River is awesome. It's an un untapped resource. Um, these two fish came from probably a mile of the 291 bridge. One, this is Andy Carmack. That's over a 100 pound blue cat. And that's me with a, just a 40 pound flathead. And that's typical. It's an untouched resource. Now that we've cut down commercial fishing uh, for game fish on the river, all you can catch out there now is carp and stuff like that for sale. Um, it's an incredible resource. People are just afraid of it. And like I was talking to someone in here earlier, it used to be a, a crap hole is what it was, a cesspool. All the sewage went right into it. It's not like that anymore. It's still nasty. When you, when you do sampling surveys with gill nets, you won't believe what we come up with in our gill nets. So it does make you a little nervous, but it, it's very, very clean. The fish are safe to eat. You know, they're testing the water all the time. And we'd like to keep it that way. Um, this one, I, I, it's not a really good picture, but it's awesome. It shows you, it's kind of like our river systems, our, our, our blood vessels and veins. Our rivers are that way to the state of Missouri. So when we look at big head carp, we can really see, following our river system again, uh, and then our big lakes, everything, they can basically go across the whole state, especially when it floods. And this year has been phenomenal for flooding. So very bad invasive species that will and can, uh, can and will have a big impact on the state of Missouri. The last two, I do these guys every day. 
Um, I'm a wildlife damage biologist. I cover 24 counties. I go all the way up to the Iowa line, all the way over to Chillicothe, all the way over to uh, the Missouri River border. And beaver are our number one nuisance animal in the state, and a lot of people don't believe that. But their fur isn't as valuable anymore as it used to be. Um, we don't have the amount of trappers that we have in the, that we used to have, um, and their population levels have just skyrocketed, and they cause tremendous amount of monetary damage. So I probably could do beaver work every day in those 24 counties, but a lot of it's here in the metropolitan area because of the amount of damage they do. Otters, um, same way, and this is our fault. We reintroduced otters in the state of Missouri. We traded Louisiana. Yeah, give me a dirty look back there. I saw that. <laughs> they can cause a lot of damage as well. They can get into fish hatcheries, they can get into ponds, and they can clean them out overnight. Um, beavers are territorial. Um, so they, they come off our river system and they find a spot and they set up shop. And they're, they're pretty long lived because they don't really have any natural predators other than me. So they, the lifespan could be up to 20 years. Beaver are also huge dispersal critters and that's why I, I put them in here. And when I talked to Steve the other day, uh, he, he's been on the Missouri River and his comment was, I cannot believe the amount of beavers I saw on the Missouri River. Well, their territories are a lot smaller because it's a big river. So you can go every couple hundred yards and hit another colony of beaver. And they protect their colonies just like mountain lions. The beavers will attack and kill other beavers trying to get into their territory. Um, we've joked about it, and this was kind of neat for this presentation. We call the Missouri River uh, the I-70 for beavers. And then all the other Little rivers are like 40 Highway and, and 23rd Street. They just keep breaking down that way. And they, they'll find that water. They can sense water. They can hear it. They can smell it. And they will go into the weirdest places and set up shop and, of course, dam it up so they can, if they can swim in the water to cut food, they're safer, and that's what they do. They make great habitat for other wildlife, and that's what we're after, but they do cause a ton of problems. They have uh, two to four young every year. Those young will be allowed to help with the next year's litter, help raise them, take care of them, big brother, big sister. At two years of age, mom and dad kick them out, physically kick them out, and I mean physically force, bite, whatever, and make them move on. So those dispersal beaver go back to wherever and probably hit our rivers and then they go find their own place to set up. So once that starts occurring, which it is, um, every year you have dispersal beaver moving out and our population keeps growing and growing and growing. Otters don't have territories really, and they disperse out every year. They, they'll stay as a family unit. Um, generally, the dad won't stay with them. They'll go out and make a male group and run around, um, but mom will keep the young, again, two to four, um, until the following spring when the next young are born, and then those young otters disperse out, and they generally go 30 to 50 miles and start setting up and, and doing the process over again. So you've got otter dispersing out every year. They don't generally uh, use the same den sites. They don't, they're not real good diggers, so they'll take advantage of a beaver den, uh, a muskrat den, or something like that. Um, but now we have, we have two animals. They're a little different. One's territorial and one's not, but they're using our river systems to disperse out all across the state. And again, if we go back to that nice, lovely photo, that's the whole state. So, and it all keys off of, in my opinion, the Missouri River. This is otter stuff, um, and I'm just real brief because I'm probably running out of time. I've pretty much figured out a 45-minute presentation is about 30 slides, but this is a brand new one, so I don't know. Um, mom and juvenile otter teaching it how to fish. This is otter scat. It's real easy to spot. Otters have toilets. This is a toilet. They use the same spot in an area all the time, a latrine. Um, and if you look real close, you can see scales, crawdad claws. Their primary food in the state of Missouri is crawdads. Um, other states, it varies. Um, like in Colorado, I think their primary food is fish, um, but they still get crawdad in their, in their scat. Here in Missouri, it's crawdads, but they do eat a lot of fish. Um, what happens with an otter they get into a thrill kill mode, kind of like a mink. Um, they're not hungry anymore. It's just that they're a playful animal and they're a carnivore. And they think it's fun to go down and get a fish and bite it, bite its head off and put it in a pile and go get another one and get another one and get another one and get another one. 
until there's nothing left. They do it a lot more in the wintertime because fish are lethargic and they don't move around as fast, so they're easier to capture. And we get most of our damage calls um, come in the wintertime on otter. And we've got video of an otter killing 138 catfish in three hours. So they can, you know, your small little farm ponds and stuff that you stock, um, they can clean it out pretty quick. And it's not just because they're eating, they're just having fun. Mink do the same thing with chickens. They'll get in a chicken coop and they'll kill one or two and drink the blood and then they go nuts and kill them all and pile them up nice and neat for the farmer in the morning. Yes, sir? Um, at, they don't key on that large a fish. When, the, when they're small, they will. But as the fish get larger, otters don't seem to key on them. Um, but yeah, that was a great, you know, that's a great thought, and we've thought of that too. Um, start eating these carp, but there's just too many carp. So, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's what otters do. And like I said, we, we reintroduced the otters. We, our last stocking was in 1980, and by 1989, we had to have a, a trapping program because they were causing that much damage and there was a strong outcry. One thing we didn't think about when we did otters was back when we had otters, um, early 1900s, our river system and our stream system was completely different than what it is today. They meandered. They were wider, they were deeper, and then we came along and screwed them all up, and now the habitat for the otters is not as good or not available like it used to be in the early 1900s, late 1800s. So our guys that know the four-syllable and five-syllable words weren't thinking. So, and that, again, that's what you'll find when you've got an otter present, you'll start finding dead fish and not, not necessarily eaten. If they're eaten, they're gonna, you're going to find a skeleton um, and not much of the fish left. When they start getting crazy, that's what you're going to find. Just dead fish laying on the ice. And we got a lot of them around here. I'm at, I'm at uh, Longview, Blue Springs, um, Chicomo, Smithville, every, every winter. They get in boats, they tear the boats up. They're, they're, they're attracted to the brush piles where the fishermen go to catch fish because the fish are attracted during the wintertime. So that's where the otters go. And of course, all of our, our ponds that people are stocking. Beavers is, is the other one. Um, I started this position in 2006. We don't recommend relocation of wildlife. I'm not a bad guy, really. Um, I do like wildlife, but knowing what we know, we euthanize almost all of it. Um, I will not euthanize bobcats or anything unless they've really done some, something bad but none of them have yet. They're, they're a cool animal. Um, beavers, on the other hand, I've probably removed over a thousand beavers in the Kansas City area since 2006. It's just that bad of a problem and there's that many. This is a park downtown and it's not even a really good picture because there's about 14 other old growth oak trees that all they did was girdle because they have to keep their teeth down so they can close their mouth. So they use the oaks and they just girdle them. They kill the tree because it's down into the cambium. And those trees had to be cut down for public safety. So not only do they, they eliminate this pond here, that was a guy's dock, and that's now the Beaver Lodge, or it was. But this pond was completely surrounded by nice trees, and if I, just, I couldn't get a real good photo of it, but there's not a, not a tree left on this pond. They cut every one down. Um, oh, you can see the stumps back there but then they start blocking things up. This is off of uh, 69 Highway. It was actually flooding the highway. It was backing up, they backed up this culvert. This is a pretty big dam. It's not a really good picture, but it's probably 50 yard long dam. And the water was coming out onto the highway and causing accidents. And we get that a lot uh, from MoDOT, it calls me a lot. Um, I think I've got another one. Oh, this is up again off of Shoal Creek. Um, towns don't like it when they put in a new road and develop it, make it all pretty, and, and then their trees get cut down overnight. And you can see how industrious they are. They left that one, whoops, they left that one hanging. And it flipped in the, they had them wired up, and so they cut it off, and it flipped so then they could cut all the branches off and eat them. I mean, they know what they're doing. Um, they destroyed I don't know how many hundreds of trees up here off the Shoal Creek Parkway. 
You guys remember when Bass Pro went in? Remember the falls over there? They used to have uh, aspens over there when they first planted. There's not an aspen left over there, and those were about $500 a piece. The beavers found them immediately. So, um, This is a railroad, railroad company. This was actually flooding the, the railroad and uh, causing uh, this to collapse. And th this is on both sides of this field. You can't see this side of it from where I stopped my truck, but this goes back at least a half a mile and then a half a mile on the other side. Um, and this was a farmer's field. It was soybeans, but completely flooded out by a colony of beavers. Um, it was awesome when I pulled up because of the, the habitat beavers do provide. There was thousands of ducks using this because it was a nat there was food there for them and, and natural water. I mean, it was awesome. Um, otters actually moved into here too, but it was actually threatening the integrity of this, this railroad structure right here which was used two or three times a day. And this was out by uh, Blackwater. So beavers cause a ton of, a ton of damage. And they, again, use our, our waterways. I thought this was cool. That's the river race. But if we go back to our one slide, eventually all things merge into one. That's all I've got. <laughs>